just to give you a little bit of an overview, Acts 16 talks about um, part of Paul's second missionary journey. He made three. So Acts 16, the second missionary journey starts, we looked last week at Acts 15, 36, and then it goes up to chapter 18, verse 22. That always is Paul's second missionary journey. This is a map of Paul's second missionary journey. It occurred in the years 41, 49 to 51. So we're talking about 20 years or so after Jesus, not less than 20 years, 17, 18 years after Jesus died, was resurrected, and ascended. So we're not talking that long since all this stuff actually happened that we read about in the Bible. And the eyewitnesses that saw all this stuff, still living, still around, by the time Paul writes 1 Corinthians 15, he says Jesus appeared to over 500 brothers. Brother. Some, some have fallen asleep, but most of which were still alive at that time, and that was your even later than this. So, this missionary journey starts here in Antioch of Syria, okay? And as you can see, you may or may not be able to see the actual arrows, but it goes all the way up into Greece, all the way down around here, back down to Jerusalem, and then he ends up back up at Antioch. We're only going to be, in Acts 16, looking at the journey from Antioch over to Philippi. Right, right in that, that section of the trip. Just so you know, Paul did this voluntarily. After he makes the first missionary journey, you can read about that in Acts 13 and 14. Um, in Acts 15, he goes to Barnabas. Barnabas was the one that went on the first missionary journey with him. He goes to Barnabas and said, why don't we go back to all the places we went and see how they're doing? And Barnabas, of course, says yes. So they're going to, they do it voluntarily. Paul ends up taking Silas and going on his trip. And Barnabas actually takes um, John Mark and goes another way. But he does this voluntarily. The reason I point that out is this was a, between a two and a three year journey. Okay? It involved a total of about 2,700 miles that he traveled. About 1,300 miles of it by sea, about 1,400 miles of it by land. Now traveling was not easy back then, nor was it cheap. Paul was working to support himself unless he happened to have a benefactor, which most of the time he didn't. So to do to take this chunk of time out of think about taking this chunk of time out of your personal life to travel all kinds of places you've never been to, right? Um, to cultures you've not been to, because especially when you read about Philippi, that was a Greek city. It wasn't like that was second nature to Paul. But he chose to do this for Christ. That's the take on us. And we'll see more of that as we read on. He chose to do this for the cause of Jesus Christ. And we'll talk about his degree of commitment to that. So, the first thing I want to do, though, is simply read Acts 16. And so if you don't have your Bibles or phones or whatever it is you're using, we're going to read Acts 16. Now, would anyone like to read? You don't have to, but would you like to read? We're going to, I'm going to be reading New King Day first. Yeah, I'll read it for you. You're going to read it? Okay, if you would, just read loudly so everybody can hear. Then he came to Berk from Jerusalem. And behold, a certain disciple was there, named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed. But his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who lived in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go on with him. And he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region. For they all knew that his father was free. And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. Now when they had gone through Phrygia, good. You just, it doesn't matter if you pronounce it I'll keep it right. Three right on. Three. Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word of the nation. After they had come from Russia, they tried to go to the Thangian, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Russia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And I, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Semaphras, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from 
declared in Philippi, which is the former city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. And on the seventh day, we went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira, who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed by possessed with the spirit of divination, met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune them. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and then said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly troubled our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful, lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and prevented them to be beaten with rods. And they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them to prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains. And everyone's chains were loosed. And everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. He brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them at the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced having believed in God with all his household. And when it was day, the magistrates sent the officers, sent the officers saying, let those men go. So the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul, saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us over the condemned, uncondemned Romans and have thrown us in prison. And now that they put us out secretly, no, indeed, let them come themselves and get us out. And the officers told those words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. And then they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart from the city. So they went out into prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them to depart. Thank you so much. Have a nice one. Good job. Okay, so we're going to go back through this in a little bit more detail, but I wanted you to get an overview. Um, I'll just mention at this point, the most important kind of biblical research is simply to read the Bible. The most important kind of biblical research is to read God's Word. If you never look up the tank, read God's Word and you I really encourage you to do that routinely. There is something about reading God's Word that gets... Um, the truth more in your heart and Christ more in your heart. Just the physical act of sitting down and being. I really encourage you to do that. Now, let's look a little closer at Acts 16, and we'll go sort of verse by verse here. First of all, we talked, I mentioned about Paul's commitment to the cause of Christ. Um, I mentioned that he went on this missionary journey, this two or three year, 2,700 mile trip, voluntarily. Okay, nobody's going to help him. 
It's just the part of the Swiss girl. So he ends up going with Silas. So right now, Paul and Silas are taken off on this journey. There's two guys. By the way, Silas was from Jerusalem ultimately as well, went up to Antioch to deliver the epistles that came out of the church council in Acts 15. But this is only to Silas too. I mean, Silas is just as much a man of God as Paul was in terms of having guts to do this. And I liken this, um, Paul's commitment, we'll, we'll see tomorrow, but Paul's commitment to Christ would be like we would, in the United States, maybe we would think of somebody who's going to join the Navy SEALs or some kind of special forces, and they were willing to give their life. They knew that could happen. They were willing to do that. That's what Paul was talking about. He was willing to give their life. And that's what it took. That was fine. <clears throat> so let's look at that in a little more detail. First of all, you can turn here, but you don't really need to. We're going to look at Acts 21, which is um, it's after the missionary journeys are done. Paul is actually on his way to Jerusalem, right? He's, he's going to Jerusalem. He wants to, um, it's important to him at this point in his ministry to sort of communicate with the apostles and elders. So he's on his way there, okay? So let's look at Acts 21.4. And you can again either look it up or just read from the screen. And finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem, right? A little later in that chapter, Acts 21, 10 through 14. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, his girdle. They had these flowing garments. They held them together with a girdle. So that's what he's referring to as a belt. When he uh, took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, not many men have that kind of commitment to anything. Very few have that kind of commitment to Christ. Some would have that kind of commitment to the military. Very few to Christ. Let's look at one other place, uh, Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. Now, when Paul writes Philippians, you may remember we looked at a timeline last week. He writes Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon when he's in prison in Rome at the end of the book of Acts. In the context of, of chapter 1 here, we'll just read these few verses. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds by chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed to the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. To Paul, it didn't make any difference if they were preaching Christ so that he had a worse imprisonment. That didn't matter. The important thing was that Christ was preached. So Paul's commitment to Christ was to the death, if that's what it took then he was willing to do that. Now, these first couple of verses of Acts 16, we um, meet Timothy. Timothy was, we talked about this a little bit last week, but I want to refresh your memory. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, um, Paul writing to Timothy, this is at the end of, after the imprisonment that we read about at the end of the book of Acts. The books of 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus are written after that. Okay, so this is before Paul's martyred, but after the imprisonment we read about at the end of the book of Acts. He writes, let no one despise your youth. He's writing to Timothy now, so he's addressing Timothy as a youth. But be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Now, he's addressing Timothy as a youth. In biblical culture, a youth was not like in the United States, 15, 18, 21. A youth was maybe 30 years old. You were still considered young then. 
Luke talks about when Jesus started his ministry, and it says he began to be about 30 years of age. 30 was still considered young. So when Paul writes this, Timothy's probably 30 or maybe a little less than that. The point being, this was written about 12 years before the record we just read about in Acts 16. How old does that make Timothy in Acts 16? If you take 30, 30 from 12, yeah, 18. 18 years old, when we read about Timothy in Acts 16. Now, another kicker is, he was Paul's fruit in Christ, so to speak. That is to say, Timothy came to a saving knowledge of Christ under Paul's ministry. When Paul was in Lystra, that was Timothy's hometown, in Acts 14, two years before this, so if Timothy comes with saving knowledge of Christ when he's about 16 years old. He, well, so Timothy's first Timothy's first encounter with we'll skip ahead here. Timothy's first encounter with the Apostle Paul was in Acts 14, 8 through 20. Now we have to actually turn there. I didn't put it on my right here, so if you want to read it, you can turn to Acts chapter 14. If you don't want to read it, I will read it to you. So in Acts chapter 14, verse 8. And in Lystra, again, Lystra was Timothy's hometown. This is the first missionary journey. All comes here to spread Christ. Lystra is a heathen town, a pagan town. There's not a Jewish population there. Paul doesn't go to the synagogue like he does a lot of places. These are, uh, if you will, idolaters. I mean, they try to worship Paul and Barnabas in this case as Jupiter and Mercury. Okay? So these people are, are idolaters. They are worshiping idols. Okay, so Paul comes here to spread God's word. So in verse 8, And in Elisha, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his own womb, who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking. Paul observed, observing him intently, and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet, and he leaps and walked. Now when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Again, they worship idols. They're thinking Jupiter and Mercury came down to earth. That was actually a pretty common mythological theme anyway. Lots of times that happened. <clears throat> Verse 12. And Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes, those are alternative names for Jupiter and Mark, for Jupiter and Mercury, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, intending to sacrifice with multitudes. And when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard this, they tore their clothes, ran in among the multitude, crying out, and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you, and preached to you that they, would, that they would turn from these useless things to the living God, who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them, who in bygone generations allow all nations to walk in their own ways, nevertheless he did not leave himself without witness, and that he did good, he gave us rain from heaven and, fruit, and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. Next verse. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium. Okay? The Ant uh, I'll, be, I'll go back to the map. It's Antioch of Pisidia. It's a different Antioch. The Jews come from those places, come to Lystra, and now read what they do. Having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Right? That's what they do. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he goes up and went into the city. So he gets up from supposing him to be dead and goes back where they just stoned him and worshipped him as an idol. He goes back in there again. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Turkey. Now, that's the end of that section. The reason I read that section is that was Timothy's first exposure to Paul. So when Paul comes to Lystra two years later, he says, Timothy, I'm looking for you. What do you think Timothy about Lystra? What do you think he's coming? All the way up, he goes, and he's how old? Sixteen when this happened. Eighteen when Paul says that he was really. Now he had a Jewish mom. Um, 2 Timothy 3.15 just talks a little bit about his upbringing. 
as a child and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. He had an upbringing at the feet of a godly mother, not a godly father. His father was Greek, not a Hellenist, not a convert, a convert to Judaism, but still a Greek. He was just a Greek, unbelieving Greek. Yeah. So his father wasn't involved in his spiritual upbringing. And that's why um, they had to circumcise him, because the Jews would have known he would not be circumcised, his father would not have done that, his father was a Greek. Now, 2 Timothy 3, 10, and 11, just want to point this out. Again, we talked about Paul's commitment to Christ, now we're talking about Timothy's. Okay? 2 Timothy 3, 10, and 11, But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. This was Timothy's introduction to the gospel. This is how he first saw Paul, and this is what Paul's going to take him on in the second missionary journey. So, talking, now, this may be a dumb question. Everybody knows what circumcision is, right? If you don't, Somehow, it's signal without raising your hand. <laughs> okay, so circumcision is commonplace now, but in the ancient world, males were not circumcised unless they were Jews, because it was part of the Abrahamic covenant with God. Circumcision was part of that. Timothy was not circumcised. So, you may be familiar with surgical techniques nowadays. They typically use something called anesthetic which typically helps you not feel what it is you're going to do. Uh, okay. But in the ancient world, there was no anesthetic like we think of it at all. That wasn't even, that didn't come around even in modern times until the 1800s. Okay, so even early America, when they were cutting guys' legs off in the Civil War because they were shot so bad they couldn't save it, they took a saw, they put a stick in the guy's mouth to bite it, and they saw it through the leg. That's exactly what they did. Maybe you got a shot of whiskey, but other than that, there was no such thing as anesthetic. Yeah, well, we'll talk about that right here. In the ancient world, alcohol was sometimes used to, to deaden the senses. Opium, same way, to deaden the senses. They aren't really anesthetics. I mean, they don't kill the pain. They don't make you go to sleep. They may go to sleep with opium, they probably kill you because what opium is what narcotics do is slow down your breathing so much that you just quit. That's why people, when they overdose, that's why they die. They quit breathing. That's what happens. So they might deaden your senses a little bit, but they're not an anesthetic. Okay. Uh, by the way, on the right here, those are scalpels. Those are ancient scalpels, made of brass. Okay. And the kicker with this too is, so Paul comes to Timothy and says, Timothy, I want you to do it. I got circumcised. Okay, and the record says, Paul did this. Paul circumcised. Right now. So, Timothy's 18. There's an aesthetic. Paul says to Timothy, I got circumcised. And that wasn't the half of it. I'm going to get circumcised, and then what's going to happen after that? Right? But Timothy is absolutely a man of steel. He is absolutely a man of steel, as is Paul. These guys have unparalleled commitment to Christ. They were willing to do whatever it took. It didn't matter what it was. 
So the le- our first life lesson is um, how far does Jesus Christ being your boss really go? The word Lord is a religious term. We read about it a lot, obviously, in God's Word. The Greek word kurios is the word that's usually translated Lord in the New Testament. We'll read it actually in Acts 16 when we read about the, the young girl who had possessed the devil. And it says when, their, when the, her master saw the hope of their gain was wrong. The word masters is the word kurios. Okay? It simply means boss. And nowadays, I think it would probably be better for us to think of Jesus Christ as boss versus Lord. Because boss communicates more to the American mind. You're going to do what your boss says. You're not going to second guess your boss. He pays you. You're going to do what he says. That's what Jesus Christ is supposed to be for us. So how far does Jesus Christ as being your boss really go? What personal price are you willing to pay for God's word living in your life or in the lives of your family, friends, or anybody who's unsaved? What price are you willing to pay? And I'm not talking about, okay, I mean, you know, we all have to make commitments to die. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about reading the Bible today, financially giving of your abundance where you're supposed to, um, giving in some way in terms of service at this church or some church if you don't go to this church, doing the things that would make you a Christian, uh, that grow Christ in you, that make you become more Christ like. That's the commitment I'm talking about. I'm not talking about you got to go out and die for Christ right now. I'm just talking about in your everyday life, is there evidence that you're actually a Christian? And I'm not, by saying that, I'm not questioning. I'm not saying there isn't. I'm only saying, ask yourself that question. <clears throat> and Luke 6.46 was a, one scripture that I thought about, but this is Jesus speaking, right? He says, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? I <laughs> uh, wanted to, uh, let's see, um, so we got through, let's just glance at Acts 16, you might want to go there by the Bible for a oh, We're going to sort of go, we're not going to read the whole thing again, but I'll probably point a couple of things out. Um, just a reminder now, so Paul there in Troas, um, if, if you want to know where that is, you're going to have to go back to the map of the weather. They're in Troas, okay? So it's in Greece. It's in Macedon, which is northern Greece. Right? <clears throat> and Paul has the vision. And then we read in verse 10. Now, after he had seen the vision, Paul had seen the vision, immediately, next word, we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, uh, the reason I point that out is who wrote the book of Acts? Does anyone know? Luke. Luke wrote the book of Acts. Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke. He was the only Gentile author of a Bible book, Luke and Acts. Okay? Um, the fact that he used the word we there in verse 10 of chapter 16 means he was with Paul. He met Paul in Troas. He was in Troas with Paul. Until then, it was only Paul and Silas. And, and uh, they meet Timothy and Elisha. So it's Paul, Silas, Timothy, and then Luke joins him in Troas. So now it's four guys. Paul, Timothy, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke. These, uh, we call them the we sections of the book of Acts. This first one is from chapter 16, verse 10, through chapter six, the end of chapter 16, really. It extends through while Paul is in the book. But at the end of chapter 16, we won't necessarily go into the other ones because it doesn't really but this we section ends there because Luke apparently doesn't go on with Paul in this missionary journey. He stays in the mind. Now the reason that's significant in my mind, you know, to me, is Paul, in fact, remember this missionary journey was 49 to 51 AD, right? Paul doesn't get back to Philippi to visit the Philippian believers until about 56 or 57 AD, five or six years later. So they don't see Paul. Luke apparently stays there because he's the next we section of the book of Acts when Luke is with him again corresponds to when Paul comes back to Philippi. So it seems like Luke actually stayed in Philippi. And when we read about what happened in Philippi, for anybody to stay in Philippi, that was significant because of what Paul and Thomas were doing. If that 
that has happened in a place where you were, that has to be so awesome when you stay there. So, um, anyway, that's the we sections. We won't talk too much about that. If you want to know more about those, maybe you could ask me later, but that's, those are the, there are three of them, we sections of the Bible, of the, of the book of Acts, when Luke was actually with Paul in his travels. Okay, so then we get to Lydia. Okay, so if you remember in the vision, right, what does Paul see in the vision, right? A man of Macedonia, which he would have known by, just by the dress, by the way he has dressed. Okay, man of Macedonia, encouraging him to sing from over and out. So, when we read about them going to this place of prayer, first of all, to live by, there's no, we don't read about Paul going to the synagogue. There wasn't a Jewish population here to live by. It was a Greek city. So it wasn't like Paul would go in the synagogue and preach Christ and there would be people who would believe because there wasn't one there. They had a little place where people resorted to prayer outside the city gates. That's where he goes. He talks to the women and he does this you know, repeatedly. Some days. Luke says they were there some days. But then the only person that's named that actually believed in Jesus Christ was Lydia. That's it. She was sort of the man of Macedonia, if you know what I mean. Okay. So, just a little background on Lydia. She was a seller of, it says purple. It was purple fabric. The reason, she was probably a little too. The purple fabric that she sold, it says she was from Aya Tiru, okay? Another city. We know from the description, there was actually a guild of sellers of purple, a union in Aya Tiru of people who sold purple fabric. The reason it was expensive is, it was required in the quote-unquote official garment, official choga, of Rome, in the city of Rome, and to live by was a colony of Rome. It was like a little Rome away from Rome. Okay? So the official toga had this purple fabric in it. She was probably fairly wealthy. She had an extra house to be staying. They weren't staying with her. When she said, hell no, a house, she wasn't talking about staying with her. She had a house, they could stay in the house. So she was fairly wealthy too. Okay? And um, there's nothing wrong with money. The Lord needs wealthy men and women absolutely needs them because it takes money to move God's word. Money is a tool. That's all it is. It's a tool. She was the only person named who believed in Philippi. There isn't anybody else actually named. The, the, prison, uh, the, the prison guard. He's always just the prison guard. He doesn't have a name. Lydia is the only one actually named that believed in Jesus Christ. Not that there weren't others, but she's the only one named. She's not mentioned again in the book of Acts. She's not mentioned again anywhere in the New Testament. This is the only place she's mentioned. And uh, because she was kind of the foundational believer, so to speak, she was probably instrumental in the growth of the Philippian church. What's interesting about that is, number one, the Philippian church was probably the closest church to Paul. They were um, the dearest to him, so to speak. He was the dearest to them. He never had to do with the Philippian believers what he had to do with the Corinthians, defending his apostles or the Galatians trying to figure out grace versus, he never had to do that. The Philippians were just good from the start. And Lydia, probably Luke too, if you stayed there, they were part of that. The other thing that, I, that I comes to mind is Philippians, if you read the letters, you know, the epistle again is a fancy word that means letter. Okay, so Paul writes a letter. So he wrote a letter to the Philippians, right? If you read that letter along with the other letters, Philippians is the only one in the salutation in the hello that says bishops and deacons. There, are, there is another letter that he wrote that includes bishops and deacons. So the work in Philippi was mature enough that he could address the bishops and deacons. And that's significant because, again, Lydia got in on the ground floor. She must have been part of that. <clears throat> and the man of Macedonia was in part a woman. And, uh, and the other thing you need to remember is she's, this is the first time in Philippi that the word of Christ is preached in Europe. This is the first recorded instance of outreach in Europe. Lydia is the first named believer that believed God's word in Europe. Okay. That's it. So. Uh, okay, so let's glance at, yeah, let's, I don't want you to see that yet. Let's glance at uh, these verses again. Let's see. Let's, okay, in 16, if you want to move along. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. Of course, that only occurred in biblical times. We don't have that in the second time. Of course. Right? 
Okay, so I knew that was wrong, so I just do a quick Google search for fortune telling in North Carolina and in Kernersville. Don't you know there are 77 fortune tellers in North Carolina? What do you know about that? I'll be done. Happened in the first century, happening right now. Same thing. As if it was written today, the same thing's happening. Um, and a life lesson along those lines. The best way to understand the times in which we live is to read, study, and hold God's word in your head. Okay? Human nature has not changed. People are people. And God's word is the rule book for people. It's how you're supposed to behave and what you're not supposed to do. So if you want to know about our times, the best way to do that is read God's word. <laughs> 77 fortune tellers in good old North Carolina. So we read, read that record, um, and I don't, some of you may be uh, either unfamiliar with, uncomfortable with the idea that, that the devil, first of all, that number one, there is a devil. The Bible is very clear about the fact that there is a God, and that there is a devil. Okay? Very clear about that. It's also very clear about the fact that the devil is evil, God is good. You may be you're unfamiliar with or uncomfortable with the fact that the devil has spirits that work for and with him, just like God has angels. Yes. And that those spirits can oppress or possess a person and either force or mold their behavior. Those are all things we can learn from this record. Um, the devil can and does influence or direct human behavior through spirit possession or oppression. That really happens now. Now, I'm not saying for a moment that all bad behavior is a devil spirit. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is it can happen just like it happened in God's Word. Okay? The devil, God's Word, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, let's just read that. This is Paul writing to the Corinthians, his letter to them. Whose minds the God of this age has blinded. He's referring to the devil. The God of this age has blinded. Who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Now, from that verse alone, what is the devil's primary objective? To prevent Christ, you from knowing Christ. The devil's primary objective is to prevent you from knowing Christ. Whatever he does is to that end. Okay? But he's referred to as the God of this age. Okay, we don't just have one God in this world. We have God Almighty, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is another God, very active, the God of this age, the devil. Okay? If you think he's not there, you do so at your own um, detriment because he's very much there and very much working against us. <clears throat> and the other thing to, to know, though, is Paul turns to the girl. This is, this is the young girl. She does this for many days. These guys are the great power of God. These guys are the great power of God for many days. Paul turns to the girl, says to the spirit, come out of her. And then she stops doing it. So all I want to point out to you is, yes, there's a devil. Yes, he has spirits. Yes, those spirits can possess people or oppress people. But the spirit that's in you, Christ in you, is greater than anything the devil has. Because Paul proved that. And it says it in 1 John 4, 4. Okay. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. But we need to learn that from this record. The devil is alive and well. If you think he's not, you're mistaken. You're, you're really mistaken. And then the other thing I want to just point out is um, we think in the first century, I, I, I think sometimes when we read the records in the uh, New Testament, we think that you know, Christianity was just both barrels blazing, millions of people believing in Christianity, all kinds of signs, miracles, wonders all the time. Okay, so they get this led by. And what do the what do the guys, you know, the masters of the girl, when their hope their game was gone, they grab Paul and Silas, bring them before the magistrates. These, and what do they call them? Jews. Call them Jews. Not Christians. In Philippi, there's no such thing as Christians. Everybody was a Jew. 
Now, the problem with that, or the reason I want to point it out is, just like nowadays, everybody's got prejudices. Everybody comes to everything with filters, right? You look at everything you do with filters, whether it's a person, heck, anything. You, what you read, you, you've got filters on. Everybody's got filters, right? Back in the first century, they did too. Um, let's look at I think I put this up here. Yeah, the Roman emperor, it's in Acts chapter 18, like verse, did I write that down? Yeah, 18, 1 and 2. After these things, Paul departed from Athens, went to Corinth. He found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. Now, that happened. This is written after what we're reading in Acts 16. It's Acts 18. But the, but the event occurred before what we're reading in Acts 16. It occurred in 45 AD, about five or six years before. Now remember, Philippi is a colony of Rome. Don't you think Philippi is going to imitate what Rome does? Rome kicks all the Jews out. Claudius says, you guys are wrong. You're out of here. In 45 AD. Five years later in Philippi, these guys are Jews, and man, they're telling us to do stuff that it's not all for us to obey being Romans. So right, they're coming right off of that. They got a bad name. They got a bad name in the whole empire for that matter. Because everybody thinks they're Jews. There's no such thing as a Christian. Not yet. And Christianity, even early on, Pastor David has made the point, Christianity was really, you know, sort of a sect of Judaism, if you would Jewish people, especially in Jerusalem, who was largely a Jewish population that became Christian. When you get to the outlying area where Paul goes, then you know, pagan peoples are. But it was really kind of a Jewish sect initially. And then we get to the record of Paul and Silas um, being beaten. Okay? So there, um, you may remember um, Jesus being, we talk about Jesus being with. And if you've seen the Passion of Christ, the scene that they, in which they portray Christ being with is pretty dark and um, Here's why I say that. Well, let's look at a couple of things. Um, that, if you can, if you can see this real well, it's, it's, it's a picture of, a, of what we would call nowadays, and I think they still actually do this in some, like, Indonesian countries, because there was a big stink about this a few years ago in the United States when an American got what is called caned. Okay? And all they do is take those big sticks right there, and they beat the hell out of you. Pardon my language. Okay? So they're holding a the guy, and they're just beating him. And that's what these guys, now notice, uh, it says magistrates, and then it says the officers. Now those are plural. That means there was more than one of them. The officers, the, what they were supposed to do, the Greek word used is rabizo, and it was, it, it means, it's a verb, it means to be with the sick. Okay, so these guys, their job was to enforce what the magistrate said. But there was more than one when they got Paul and Silas, they rip their clothes off. It says that. The magistrates command. And if you remember last week, I talked about the imperfect tense in Greek. That's something that happens continuously in the past. The word command there, when it says they command to have a beat, it's in the imperfect tense. They do it over and over. Rip their clothes off. Beat them. Rip their clothes off. Beat them. They do it again and again. Right? And then they beat them like that. <clears throat> So you, I don't know if you're familiar with this passage, 2 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25, Paul talks about some of the beatings he sustained, right? He's, this is one of the passages where he's trying to prove his apostleship to the Corinthians. He's trying to say, I'm really an apostle. Look what I've been through, okay? From the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes minus one. Now let's just talk about that for a minute, okay? You see that thing? I don't know if you can see it in detail, but that's a whip like they would have used on Christ or like they would have used on Paul. It had, um, it had very small whips out of a kind of a central handle. And on the ends of these things, they tied like little pieces of metal or little pieces of glass. They had glass then. No, 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 no. Or they tied tie little pieces of bone or something like that so that when they whipped you, whatever was at the end of the whip would be in your skin and rip it. That's, that was the Jewish form of punishment, of lashing. That's what they did to Jesus Christ. That's what they did to Paul five times. I don't think, 
I don't remember that those are ever recorded anywhere. If they are, there, it's, if, if any instance of him being whipped is recorded, five of them are not recorded. So these five times that he's talking about in 2 Corinthians 11, they are recorded that those, in other words, they happen in addition to whatever we do. Okay. Now, that was the Jewish whipping. Okay? The Greek flavor, well, and with Jews, you'd only, it was 40, he, he says, 40 stripes save one. They would only give 39 lashes because they didn't want to go over 40. There was a penalty if they did. So they gave 39 just to be sure. Okay? Now, with Roman rods, beating with rods, there was no limit. There was no such limit. You could beat until they died. That was just fine. Didn't make any sense. And what's interesting about this passage, too, the next thing he says is, Three times I was beaten with rods. There was only one of those recorded. This one that we're reading about in Acts 16. Two other times he was beaten like that. It's not even recorded in the New Testament. So what do you think his back looked like? You think that stuff healed up? <laughs> Again, his commitment to Christ was uh, limitless. He was willing to do whatever it took for people to believe. Now, I'm not saying that he was a masochist and that he sought out persecution. When we read in uh, Acts, oh, geez, Acts 17, and they begin to persecute and they're going to stone him, and he goes to the next city. I mean, it's not like he's looking for this. It's not, not that's not it at all. It's just that if it comes, bring it on. That's what I gotta do, then that's what I gotta do. <clears throat> Again, I'm not saying everybody is gonna be like this. People like the Apostle Paul don't come along very often. All I'm saying is when you look at a I will call this a hero story. When you look at a hero story like this, it challenges you to do more. It challenges you. Now that thing might be, read God's word every day, come to church every day, come to Bible study every day, financially give, whatever it is, whatever of those, of the seven habits that Pastor David talks about, uh, cultivating spirituality in your life, whatever those are that you need to do, I'm just talking about those. I'm not talking about go out and buy. I'm not talking about that. But when you see this, it makes you want to up the ante. <coughs> They may not have been able to, but we'll talk about that. Um, Roman law, Roman, Roman law prescribed no limits for their punishment. I mean, they're you know, clearly they could punish without retribution. You know, there were no rights. I mean, for example, here's a picture. The, the, the charges against you just start to come. Right? They, they present a falsehood. So Pilate gives in because he doesn't want the Jewish ambassador. So he gives in to it. Crucifixion was um, not just a, a punishment for crime, it was a state tool of terror. There is one instance, historically recorded by one of the Roman historians, where along the roads leading into Jerusalem, they crucified 900. Lined the roads with crosses, left the guys, the, the people that were crucified there, to show to the population if you do anything, that's what's going to happen to you. The Romans could do that. If they wanted to beat you till you're dead, they'll beat you till you're dead. That's all there was to it. There was no limitation. Um, okay, so it says they were beaten. Then they got an order from the magistrates to keep these guys securely. And when the jail, when the jailer got that, he says, okay, we're going to throw you in the game of prison. Now, Roman prisons, of course, were modern facilities, had plumbing, and electricity, and everything. They were really nice. So the inner prison was probably where all of the excrement went from all of the prisoners. Because it was downtown. 
It was also dark because later in the record we see when the test of the earthquake and all the water broke. And the jailer is about to walk, he's about to kill himself. I mean, his sword's right there. Right? He's ready to just fall on the sword because he knows that's what's going to happen anyway. We'll, we'll look at that. <clears throat> but he has to, to go into where Paul is, he has, he has to call for a light. It says he called for a light and he went in. Well, it was obviously too dark for him to go in without the light. So it was dark where Paul was. He could see the jailer apparently, but the jailer couldn't see him. He could see the jailer enough that he'd say, Don't kill yourself, we're all here. And think about whether you do that or not. How did the jailers just treat Paul and Silas a little while before? It would have been easy enough to just let him fall on his sword. You're going to be free anyway. All the doors are open. What difference does it make? He did that to me. Served him well. Paul didn't do that. Why? Because he wanted to kind of believe in Jesus Christ. That's what happened. There was no price too high to pay for Paul. There was no price too high to pay. It's, the guy was amazing. Um, so this is what stocks look like. Only stocks for the feet. It says only their feet were in them. Romans made stocks, these things, for hands and feet and even neck. You know, they'd have stocks for your feet down below. We used these in early America. You'd have your head in like this in stocks and your feet in socks so you couldn't move. Those were just the feet socks. So they put them in the inner prison, dark, probably excrement, you know, whatever other unpleasant trees you want to imagine. And that's the way they sit. Now, they were there for a number of hours before it says about midnight they started doing what? Remember what the record says? Yeah, they started and, and it's the way that the Greek reads um, it says praying they were singing. Okay? They were probably remember Silas is in Jerusalem Paul was, was um, educated straight from Gamaliel they were probably singing songs. They were probably, and they were probably therefore singing in Hebrew, right? Maybe or maybe probably Hebrew, because that's what they were born. So all the prisoners around, it's, it's so funny. Remember that imperfect tense again, right? It says the prisoners were listening. So they're trying to figure out what are these guys doing? They're in the inner prison in stock, they just got that empty out of them, and they're singing. I mean, but it's, it just says, it's so funny with this. <clears throat> and that's when the earthquake happens? Um, yeah. Praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were, were listening to them, so that's imperfect. They were, when they did this, they were, they, you know, the beatings and so forth would have happened during daylight, right? So it wasn't until the middle of the night that they get to sing. So they would have been in the prison for, I don't know, four, five, six hours, sitting in the socks, like we saw the picture. Maybe they were sitting in poop and pee, I don't know, because everything flowed downhill and that's where they were. Dark, that's and then they're singing. Now, just wrap your mind around that for a minute. Just put yourself in that situation. What would you do? Would you be questioning whether that vision you saw was really legit? Or would you be singing hymns to God? I, I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure what I'd be doing either. But just think about the commitment of Paul and Silas. And remember, where's Timothy? He's watching. He's seeing all of this. And he's on his first missionary journey after just being circumcised. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Luke's in there too. Those four guys. But Paul and Silas... The other two guys, and Timothy's 18 years old looking at this and saying, you know what? I'm not so sure. I, but he never, he just keeps going on. In fact, he gets deeper in the work. Some of the places where Paul leaves, like Thessalonica, Timothy and Silas stay there. The Jews come to persecute, Paul leaves, Timothy and Silas stay there. Timothy's 18 years old. Right? Timothy's not a little kid. He's an adult. He's Yeah, the record indicates the praying and the singing were simultaneous. Praying, they were singing. I mean, that's the way the Greek actually reads. They were probably singing in Hebrew. And then the prisoners were listening. I mentioned to you, it's in that imperfect tense. They were listening for a while. I mean, Paul and Silas were singing. I don't know how long, but it was long enough that this imperfect tense, Luke uses this imperfect tense to describe this action 
continuous as and past of praying and singing in the prison of wisdom. Okay. However long that is, I don't know. So, and then the, the, uh, the earthquake happens, right? And all the doors are loose, right? Everything's open. And we know, of course, um, let's look. Um, the guard prepares to kill himself because the prisoner had escaped, he would be killed. And we see this in Acts chapter 12. This happens actually in Acts, right? After um, Herod killed James, the brothers of James and John, so he killed James. And then he takes Peter and he's going to kill Peter, right? So Peter is, it says in the record, he's surrounded by four prisoners, four prisoners. Four so he gets out, an angel comes and busts it out. So Herod then, we'll read it right here. Then as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what would become of Peter. So Peter's gone. Why would there, not, would there would be a big stir? Because if they don't find Peter, they're all going to die. That's why there's a big stir here. right? But when Herod had searched for him and not found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. If the, if the prisoner got, got free, you're going to pay their price. And the prison guard in Philippi knew that was going to happen. So he's just going to save everybody the time. Pulls out a sword. He's ready to fall on. <clears throat> and I think it's important to remember that Paul didn't have to stop this guy from killing himself. He didn't have to do that. And after the way that the, prisoner, the prison guard probably treated Paul and Silas, again, I don't know what I'd do. But Paul's concern was not himself. Paul's concern was the cause of Christ. Anything to further the cause of Christ, anything he would do. <clears throat> 